Praise the Lord. Well, this morning our message is going to be on visitation. Visiting. And have you ever had company who came to your home and you weren't ready? And you stumbled around getting ready? Oh, look who's here. Look who's here. We'll have to get ready, you know. I think that's happened to all of us. It happens, doesn't it? And so we're going to be talking about uh, 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 visitation when that time comes when somebody comes to visit us and we're going to look at the scriptures this morning in the book of Luke in chapter 19 and verses 43 and 44 and so if you'll turn there in your Bible Luke chapter 21 or excuse me Luke chapter 19 verses 43 and 44 <clears throat> And it says here, it says, For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. The ministry of Jesus was very specific in its exclusion of the heads of officials. When Jesus went into Jerusalem, he didn't go to visit the big shots of the city. He didn't visit the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Sanhedrin. He didn't visit them. He went in and he spoke to the common people. And uh, he avoided all of these big uh, uh, political leaders and so on in the city. He was no stranger to the city of Jerusalem. It was stated, in fact, that he never spent a night in the city. And when he visited the temple, he made it his practice to spend his evenings outside of the city. He would go there, and then he would leave. On the, on the night of his ministry, one week, he came for the last time to Jerusalem, and it was the season of Passover. As he appeared openly in the temple, the multitude saw him challenge the religious leaders at that time. Finally, the Bible says that he was betrayed by one of his own people. They arrested him. They brought him before the Sanhedrin. They accused him of many crimes. But then finally, the leader of the Sanhedrin asked him, he says, uh, tell us plainly, are you the son of God? And he said in the affirmative that he was. He was accused of blasphemy. And he was sent to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate uh, examined him and spoke with him. Couldn't find any fault with him. Sent him off to uh, Herod. Herod uh, uh, mocked him and made fun of him a little bit. But sent him back to Pilate and said, I have no quarrels with this man. And so Pilate, wanting to release him, sent him uh, 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 before the people, and the people uh, uh, were given the opportunity to release him because it was the day of the Passover, and Pilate wanted to release one of the people. He says, let me release Jesus to you because it's a Passover. And they said, no, no, don't release Jesus, but give us Barabbas. And so, from that time, Pilate washed his hands and he says, I have nothing to do with this, but it, the blood of this man is upon yourself. And they cried out and said, let the blood of this man be upon us and upon our children. Now there's a lot of people who don't like the rest of the story that I'm going to tell. As a matter of fact, they want to cover their ears sometimes, and they don't want to hear it. History, sometimes when we read history, we have those who want to change history, and they want to make history into something that it isn't. Even in our modern times, we find people who uh, 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 want to go over the historical facts of things that have happened, and they want to change those things and make them into something that's convenient for themselves. Well, just recently, we... We had this thing where we lost uh, three or four men in uh, Libya and uh, the State Department and the 
the uh, the the president's people and all those around are trying to make a different story of what happened. The bottom line is that we lost some good people over there, and they were not protected. They should have been removed, or they should have been uh, protected, or something should have happened there, and it didn't. And so now everybody on all sides wants to change the story. They want to make some kind of a, a, another uh, a history concerning the, the events that happened there. This is not something new. This is something that men like to do. They like to tell their own version of the story, and they like to change the story. Well, I'm going to tell you the story as I believe the story should be told. And I'm not going to specifically tell you that this is exactly the way it happened, but I'd like to tell you that Jesus came approximately 2,000 years ago to the Jewish people. He made a visit. The great God, creator, creator of heaven and earth, the one who took dirt and made man and breathed life into him, that very creator, God himself, the Bible says in First John, or excuse me, in John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were brought into existence by the Word. And so this very Word of God became flesh and dwelt amongst men. Now that's a true historical fact. That's what the Bible tells us. He came to his own. He came to visit his people. He came knocking. And every time he came to the city of Jerusalem, he came to speak to them of his love, of his caring for them, wanting to save them, wanting to bring them into his kingdom. But the officials shut him out. The religious people didn't want to hear it. And finally, we read the story of when he was brought before Pilate and how he stood at the gates in Jerusalem and Pilate said, do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas? And the people cried out, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And then, so what should I do with this man? And they cried all the louder, crucify him, crucify him. And so we have the words that Jesus spoke when he said, they will not leave you in one stone left upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. God came calling to them and they would not hear. The Bible tells us that Jesus, when he was coming into Jerusalem one time, wept over Jerusalem and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thee as a, a mother hen would gather her flock and I would bring you to myself. And they would not hear it. They would not have that to happen. There's a scripture that I would like to read from Revelation in chapter 18. And this is, uh, uh, I'm going to read from Amplified Bible. I have an Amplified copy here that I'm going to read from. And I have a few scriptures that I'm going to carry with this. Jesus made a remark on his last visit to Jerusalem. And he said, because they would not hear, because they would not open their eyes to the visitation of God, that God would visit them. And that not one stone would be left upon the other. Now the scripture that I'm going to read is controversial, and many say that these things are yet to happen. But I want to show you a similarity of some of the things that have happened in the past, and some of the similarities of these scriptures. And my point is not to bring out a doctrine that, well, all these things have happened already, but my, uh, the idea is to show you that God will visit you if you don't recognize his visit to you today.
Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1. Then I saw another angel descending from heaven, possessing great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his radiance and splendor. Here we have an incident where the Bible tells us that an angel is going to descend from heaven, possessing great authority, and the earth would be illuminated with his radiance and splendor. Some people say, well, this is the Lord Jesus. I don't know necessarily if it would be because it says another angel and coming from the presence of God he would be illuminated you remember the story in Moses how that Moses was uh, brought to the mountain and uh, in the presence of God and when he came down from the presence of Mo God the Bible says that his face shined and it was radiant you see you can't help but to, when you are in the presence of God to be a radiant figure, that something has got to happen. And this angel came from, the Bible says, right from the uh, uh, descending out of heaven. Now in verse 2 it says, And he shouted with a mighty voice, She is fallen, mighty Babylon is fallen. She is become a resort and a dwelling place for demons, a dungeon haunted by every loathsome spirit, and a abode for every filthy, detestable bird. This Babylon, is this the Babylon where Saddam Hussein uh, uh, lived and, and uh, consorted and, and did many things? I don't think this is that Babylon. Some people have said, well, this Babylon is Rome, and Rome is that great Babylon. And uh, I would say to you that I think that this Babylon that's being spoken of here is in fact Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place, is a place where there are uh, uh, supposed to be the place of God. It's supposed to be the house of God. The temple is supposed to be the place where you could find God. But in the first century, after Jesus was crucified and resurrected, the Bible tells us that the apostles lived in Jerusalem for a while. They were greatly uh, 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 put upon by the religious people of that day. And they, uh, Herod murdered uh, John and, and they did many detestable things. But one of the things that happened uh, that we don't read too much about was that they became so uh, uh, anti-God and they worshipped idols and the city was uh, uh, ruled by about three uh, uh, great rulers of that time and each one having their own idea of what God was and who God was and so the city of uh, Jerusalem had become a Babylon of confusion and of, uh, uh, of all sorts of evil things going on in the city. Then it says in verse 3, All nations have drunk the wine of her passion, passionate unchastity, and the rulers and leaders of the earth have joined with her in committing fornication, idolatry, and the businessmen of the earth have become rich with the wealth of her excess, excessive luxury and wantonness. Here again that this Jerusalem had be, it was such a great city, such a great place, and this fits the, the, the idea of what, this, uh, uh, what city this might be. I know, as I have said, that there are those that say, well, this is not uh, that city, but that it is uh, 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 Rome. But I, I want to read a scripture in uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 21, <clears throat> and verse 9. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And all the graven images of her gods he has broken to the ground. Here is a prophecy of this great city and of horsemen coming upon this city to uh, 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 bring some vengeance to this city. Jesus said that that city would have to be visited because it missed the visitation of God. And so God was going to bring upon that city a great retribution. And so 
much, so much so that Jesus said that not one stone would be left upon another. Verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you may not share in her sins, neither participate in her plagues. I, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 51, <clears throat> verses 44. And I will punish Baal and Babylon, and I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he hath swallowed up, and the nations shall not flow together any more unto him. Yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. My people, go out of the midst of her, and deliver ye every man his soul from the fiery anger of the Lord. We get into the history now. In the history of the city of uh, Jerusalem, and some of the things that happened in that city. And the Bible uh, tells us, as I said, that Jesus said that they would build a wall around you, a bank around you, and that they would wall you in. When we read the first century history of the events of that day, around 70 A.D. Titus had a wall constructed around the entire city of Jerusalem so that no one could go in and no one could go out. This wall was reputed to be as high as the defensive walls of the city. All hope of escape for the Jews was cut off. This action was so was a direct fulfillment of the prophecies of Jesus. Famine began to rage in the city. Starving people turned to cannibalism, even killing and eating their own children. Those who were captured trying to escape from the city were crucified. Re uh, reading from the book of Josephus, uh, who was a historian, Josephus was a priest of, uh, of uh, the Jews who became like a soldier. And he fought against the Romans, but was captured. And when he was captured, he was given the opportunity to become the, to write down the, 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 the writings of the Romans and of the Jews concerning the warfare between them. And so he was given this opportunity and he, he had uh, free access by the Romans to go freely among them and to write what he had to write. He was hated at that time of the Jews because they thought that he was a traitor and that he had betrayed them. But Josephus felt that in his writings you can see that the, the Jews had forsaken God and they had turned to idols. And so he says, he felt himself that this is God. God is turning against them because of their going to idols. And so the soldiers out of wrath, this is the writing of Josephus, so the soldiers out of wrath and hatred they bore for the Jews, nailed those they caught one after another, after another, after another, to the crosses by the way of, of jest. And their multitude was so great that room was wanting for the crosses and the crosses for the body. The wars of the Jews. This is what happened. They built the wall around Jerusalem. And as those that tried to escape came out, the Roman soldiers would take them and crucify them outside of the city. And Josephus said that there were so many crosses... <clears throat> That it was that the whole around Jerusalem was all full of crosses. Now listen, they took the Savior and they brought him out and they put him on a cross. And the visitation of God coming back, what did he do? He put them on the cross. He put them as they came out of the city. He put them all on crosses. The wall around Jerusalem of the city 
which had crucified her Messiah, was now ringing with the crucified inhabitants. I know this sounds very hard to the ear, but I have to say that we're reading here the fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus gave concerning uh, uh, them missing, missing the visitation when he came. And he, he paid them back in that generation. Within 40 years of his crucifixion, within that time frame, he came back and visited that city. <clears throat> the Romans attacked down into the temple compound, but limited access were and were forced to retreat. Titus spent seven days dismantling the Anton Fortress, using material to build a roadway up to the temple. His entire force was brought upon the court of the Gentiles pictured below in this picture. He had a picture of it here, uh, an illustration. On August 27th, Titus issued orders to set fire to the gate beautiful. This was done, and the fire raged all day. August the 30th, the Romans finally gained entrance to the temple, setting it on fire and slaughtering thousands of people. Women and children hidden, had hidden themselves in the treasury uh, chamber. These were also set afire. The temple was burned, and the, and the ground, in fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus, not one stone was left upon another. And Josephus writes, Caesar gave orders that they should now demolish the entire city and the temple. The wall was so thoroughly laid, even with the ground, by those that digged it up to the foundations, that there was left nothing to make those that had come there believe it had ever been inhabited. The Romans swept through the lower part of the city, but it took another month for them to take the upper city and Herod's palace. Titus ordered that the city be leveled and all of the inhabitants to be taken captives. Some of them were sent to the salt mines. Others were held reserved to be a prayed in triumph of Titus. The, Ro the Romans began to search through the sewer systems for hidden rebels. And one man who was one of the leaders named John himself, he gave himself up. He was in prison. Another, the other leader, Simon, was caught digging his own tunnel under the wall. He was also brought back in chains. And so we have here the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Reading from verse 6, Repay her what she has paid to others. Double her doom according to what she has done. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she has mixed for others. Jerusalem was a city that had murdered the, all of those that dissented against them. The Christian church was greatly uh, impoverished and attacked in the city of Jerusalem. It was the place of the first martyr. Remember the story of Stephen? Stephen was, uh, was uh, uh, stoned. And uh, so uh, God came to bring these things back to them. Verse 7. To the degree that she glorified herself and reviled in her wantonness, living deliciously in luxury, to, the measure, to that measure imposed on her torment and anguish and tears and mourning, since in her heart she boasts, I am not a widow, as a queen, and on a throne I sit and I shall never see suffering or experience sorrow. So, her, so shall her plagues, her afflictions, her calamities come thick upon her in a single day, pestilence and anguish and sorrow and famine, and she shall be utterly consumed, burned with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. And the rulers and the leaders of the earth join her in her immorality and idolatry and luxury and with her will weep and beat their breasts and lament over her when they see the smoke of her conflagration. Here uh, in the story and the history of Josephus we read that 
when the Romans began to come down upon the city of Jerusalem, the Christian people in the city remembered the words of Jesus and they left the city. Josephus records that a great number of Christian people just got up one night and fled the city and left the city and went to distant mountain to watch what was happening. And as the Romans began to surround the city and began to burn it, the Bible says that the crying of the people on the mountains was so loud that they could hear the crying for miles away. They could hear the crying of the people crying because uh, what had happened, what was happening in the city. Uh, they st uh, verse 10, it says, They will stand a long way off in terror of her torment. They will cry, Woe and alas, the great city, the mighty city, Babylon, in one single hour, how your do doom and judgment has overtaken you. And the earth's businessmen will weep and grieve over her because no one buys their freight or cargo anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls of fine linen, purple silk, scarlet stuffs, all kinds of scented wood, sorts of articles of ivory, all varieties of objects of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, of cinnamon, spices, incense, ointments, and perfumes, frankincense of wine and olive oil, fine flour of wheat, of cattle and sheep and horsemen, conveyances and of slaves, the bodies and the souls of men. And if you read the Old Testament, you'll read how that all of those things were brought into the temple and they were supposed to be used for the worship of God, the fine linen and the frankincense and all of the incense and stuff that was brought in for that purpose and it had been used for idolatry and this was another uh, a part of the things that God was uh, uh, showing them in, their, uh, in his uh, vengeance upon them. As the dealers who handle these articles and grew wealthy through their businesses with her will stand a long way off in terror of her doom and torment, weeping and grieving aloud and saying, Alas, alas, the great city that was robbed in fine robed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, bedecked and gilded with gold and precious stones and with pearls. This is a direct regard to the temple, the temple gold, the temple, uh, uh, the clothing of the, of the, uh, uh, the priests of that uh, temple and all of the things that uh, pertain to it, the gold and the precious stones and so on. Verse 17, because in one single hour all the vast wealth has been destroyed, wiped out. All the ships, captains, and pilots, and navigators, and all who live by seafaring, and the crews, and all who ply their trade to the sea, stood a long way off. The Bible tells us that where's our lesson in this? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. God is calling. God is speaking to your heart. God is giving all of us the opportunity to receive him. Are you aware of your time of visitation? Do you know that God is standing at the door of your heart? That God is speaking to you? Do you know that? The day of the Lord is knocking at your heart. The great opportunity is upon you. We are like the people of Jerusalem when Jesus walked into the city, when Jesus began to preach to the city, when he began to speak of them, of their salvation when he opened the door of an opportunity. The Bible says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And what happened? There was a great day of judgment, a great day of vengeance, where God came and took those people that had crucified him, and he crucified their own people. He caused them to be crucified. The, don't think that you are going to get away with anything in this life. Some people say, well, you know, I got away with that. Nobody gets away with anything. Sooner or later, you're going to get caught by the alligator. Sooner or later, God is going to bring a vengeance upon the people of this earth. There is an opportunity, a great opportunity for you and me. We hear the word of God and God is calling us. 
calling us, calling us. <clears throat> oh, but we say, oh, I like, you know, I want to, you know, I have still my life to live. I have things that I want to do. <clears throat> and it reminds me of a scripture. And uh, Pastor uh, Joe Reagan, he used to love to quote this scripture. It says that, uh, uh, that uh, let, me, let me just turn to it in the Gospel of John. And let's look at this scripture. <clears throat> In chapter uh, 3, and in verse 19, it says, This is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doth, doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth, doth trust cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest and that they are wrought in God. So you see that, that they're, they, here it says the condemnation of the light has come into the world. The light is still in the world. The, the light is searching in the world, knocking at the door of your heart. Oh, I, I love the Lord, but Friday night I got to go out and you know, have a good time with the fellas and this and that and the other. Oh, I love the Lord, but you know, I, I love my own time. To, I got to go do this and I got to do that. Oh, I love the Lord, but I don't like the... I, I only like to talk of those religious things when religious when it's uh, Sunday morning uh, or Sunday afternoon. But uh, the rest of the week, that belongs to me. I don't, I don't have time for that religion, you know. <clears throat> There's a song that says uh, in the chorus, it says, Oh, the weeping and the wailing when the lost are told of their condemnation. They will cry out for the rocks, the mountain and the rocks to fall upon them. The Bible says that they will pray, but their prayers are going to be too late, too late, too late. Do not be like the pity of uh, the people of that city who chose another way, who chose Barabbas instead of Jesus, who said, no, go crucify him. You see, they thought that they had got away with something. Ah, oh, we'll just get him out of our life. He's, he's such a bother. But God came back and he brought an army and he destroyed that city. And it should be a lesson to us, you know, that if we learn history and we learn something from history, we don't want to repeat it. We don't want that thing to happen again, especially if it's an evil thing. We don't want that evil thing to happen. We don't want it to happen in our life. We live our life and we think we're getting away with something. Oh, I'm getting by. I'm getting by. But God is going to come and judge every person. The Bible says that every man and woman will have to stand before him. And when you stand before him, then all the things and all the way that you lived will be revealed. It'll be like a big screen and all the things that you did will be put up there. The things that your family didn't know. The things that your, that your husband didn't know. The things that your wife didn't know. All those things will be put up there. But there's a way out. If we repent and we call upon God, and ask God to forgive us. The Bible says that he is just to forgive us and that by the blood of Jesus that he would forgive our sins and wash our sins away and take them out of our life. Wouldn't that be great if we could have our sins washed away and removed and then we could start fresh and new with the Lord? And this is exactly what God wants us to do. In uh, the Gospel of John in chapter 3, Jesus says in verse 5, he said, Verily I say unto thee, except a man be born again and of, the, of, of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so that if we want to come into the kingdom of God, we need to be born again. Now, some people say, well, I don't belong to that religion. I don't belong to that born again religion. That's not a religion. Born again is the way to get into the kingdom of God. Nobody's going into the kingdom of God unless they're born again. You have to be born of the water and of the Spirit. The water is the washing of the Word in our life, and the Spirit of God will come. He said that He would come and live right within us. The Apostle Paul said, Know ye not 
that ye are the temple of the living God. The old temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. That temple was destroyed in 70 AD. God wiped it out. But God had a new temple. You and me. A new temple. And God's living in that temple. Isn't it wonderful that God would come and live with us? And be with us every day. Not just Sunday. But every day that God would come and live with us. And be with us. And so we have this lessons of this, uh, uh, this uh, thing that happened back in 70 AD. And uh, the history... And some people like to wash it under the sink and say, oh, oh we don't want to, you know, we don't want to talk about that anymore. We're, we're looking for something different. But I got to tell you that if we hear and learn history, and the thing about this thing that's so important is that, that God will not let things just slide by like you and I. You know, well, I'll just forget it. It's all right, you know. Somebody says an evil word to you, or they do something wrong, and, and, and then you say, Oh, that's all right. Don't Just let it go. Let it go. God is not going to let anything go. He is a righteous God. And He will exact punishment and judgment upon those that do wrong. And so we have one opportunity. While it is called today, don't miss that opportunity. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. There is no other religion. There is no other way that you can reach heaven. You will never reach the Father by talking to Buddha. You will never reach the Father talking to Muhammad or talking about Muhammad. The only way that you can get into the kingdom of God is go through the mediator. And the mediator is Jesus. The Bible says that he is the mediator of the New Testament. Don't miss this opportunity. Christ is coming to visit you today. Don't let it slip through your fingers. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your opportunity uh, for coming to us. Lord, for inviting us into your kingdom. Wash us, we pray, with your precious blood. Forgive us of our sins and our trespasses. Help us that we might do the things that are pleasing in your sight. We pray for our children and for our grandchildren, for those around about us, Lord. Help us, Lord, we pray. For all the churches and the church members of our area, Lord, we pray for them especially, Lord, that they might stand fast in the Word of God, we pray. Help us again in every opportunity to present this gospel. And we ask it in Jesus' name. I don't amen. know if you've ever heard and this amen. song, uh, uh, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Did you ever hear that song? His Eye is on the Sparrow? song praise the lord everyone help me with this number 36 in the green book then jesus came i gotta see what chord it's a minor chord isn't it no no all right one sat alone beside the highway begging his eyes were blind the light he could not see he clutched his rags and shivered in the shadows 
Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. From home and friends, the evil spirits drove him. Among the tombs, he dwelt in misery. He cut himself as demon powers possessed him. When Jesus came, and set the captives free. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory. When Jesus comes to stay Verse 5 So men today Have found the Savior able They could not conquer passion, lust, and sin Their broken hearts Had left them sad and woe then Jesus came and dwelt himself within. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and he fills the life with glory for all is changed when Jesus comes to stay Amen we have no private interpretation Amen I'm in, in Ezekiel and uh you know, there's so much going on today, as there is every day in this world. This world is full of darkness. We know that Jesus is the only light. And those of us that are in him can see the light. If we're born again in him, we can see the kingdom of God. I, I want to remind us of three men who saw the kingdom. They saw Christ before he was born of the Virgin Mary. They saw him. And their names were Noah, Daniel, and Job. And it says in Ezekiel 14, starting at 12, The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it and will break the staff of the bread thereof and will send famine upon it and will cut off man and beast from it. And though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should not deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith, the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because we can be like Noah and Daniel and Job if we're in Him. Because it says that He, He alone is the righteousness of God. 
He alone. And if you're in him, if you're abiding in the vine, you have the righteousness of God in you. And so God warns the people of Israel a long, long time ago. And he said, if you sin grievously against me, this is what I'm going to do. And he goes on in this chapter. Read the whole chapter. And he did it. We know he did it. History tells us he did it. When Babylon came into Israel and then into Judah, he wiped them out. But it was because of their sin. He warned them. Rising up early, he warned them. But they would not listen. They would not. They would not. But he mentions Noah. We know somewhat about Noah from chapter 6 in Genesis. Noah built a big ark. It was at the Lord's direction. It said Noah was a righteous man. He walked with God. Do we walk with God? On a daily, moment by moment basis, is God the supplier of everything in our soul? Or do we look around at what the world has? Do we see all these little things and say, well, I gotta have all this too. And James says, well, you pray and you don't get anything. And it's because you want to consume it upon your own lusts. Well, I think Israel had the same problem. They saw Assyria living good. They were living good. They had what they needed. And they were prospering, quote unquote prospering. Well, they didn't have a thing. Because they were outside the will of God. And if we live outside the will of God, we don't have a thing. Without Jesus, you don't have a thing. But Noah built that ark. And he did it because he believed God. All right? And that's what it says. Jesus said in the beginning of his earthly ministry, repent and believe. That's pretty simple. <laughs> that's pretty simple. And I'll tell you what, it still stands today. It says, if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Amen. Amen. So Noah built that ark. He was a righteous man. He walked with God when the odds were against him. All around him, people laughed. They stared at him. What are you doing, Noah? What are you doing? Look at that big monstrosity of thing in your backyard. What are you going to do with that? Well, Noah said, well, the Lord said he's going to flood the earth. And I believe him. He's going to do it. I know he will. He don't lie. Well, <laughs> he built that ark. And Noah and his family were the only ones that were saved from the destruction that the Lord sent by water upon the earth. Noah believed. And it was counted unto him as righteousness. And there was another man mentioned. It was Daniel. Well, we know a little about Daniel from reading the book of Daniel. He got taken away when they came to Judah. They took him away, carried him off to Babylon. Well, what did Daniel do? Did Daniel complain about his circumstances? Oh man, I can't live like this. This is too hard. I can't do it. Well, Daniel just said no. I said, he said, well, let's try the Lord here. And he wasn't trying the Lord. He believed in the Lord. He said, I don't, I don't want to eat the king's meat. Well, see, the Jews had a, they, they had a, they had a dietary mineral, and they still do for the most part because God's ways are God's ways. And he said, let us eat water and pulse, whatever that is. It's probably some kind of a corn mash or something. I don't know. For, for how long was it? Brother Al, was it a week or so? It was a spell. It was a time. All right. They ate that. And the other guys, everybody else ate everything that the king had on his table. Well, it says, and it was by faith in God that those men, there was, there was four of them, including Daniel, those men were better off in appearance eating corn mash or whatever it was and drinking water than the other guys who ate 
delicious food at the king's table, the king of Babylon. That's right. They ate the good stuff. But Noah, I mean, Daniel and his friends there, Meshach, Abednego, and what was the other guy's name? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That, I believe that was their Babylonish name. But they were much better off because God blessed them because they kept his word. Daniel kept God's word. In the circumstances he was in, taken captive, living in a country that was a cultural shock for anybody, Daniel kept God's word. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my word. You will keep my commandment. Oh, hallelujah. We got to live within God's word. Don't get sidetracked by all the stuff you see. Don't get sidetracked by all the philosophy. It says the, the wisdom of man is utter foolishness with God. And God will take the base things and the foolish things of man to confound the wisdom of man. Jesus hung upon a cross the most terrible act that was ever committed to a man to kill him upon a tree. And we preach Christ crucified for your salvation. Believe it. The blood will cover you. Daniel did and he never even saw Christ but he knew he knew in his heart that God would send a Messiah and he has the other man was Job we spoke a little bit about Job during song service Job believed God and at the worst odds imaginable to man he followed through with that belief his children were gone they disappeared they got killed the devil killed them all right. His wife didn't want to know nothing. Didn't want to know nothing. He said, why don't you just curse God and die? Get it over with. Job said, no. <laughs> no. Though he slay me, I will still praise him. That's what he said. Read it. Believe it. That's what he said. If Job, which he was, backed up against a wall, he said that. And he meant it. And he's in the wall of fame because of it. Believe God. At all, whatever the odds are against you, believe Jesus can save you. And he will. And he, and he shall, he said. He's not a liar. He's not a liar. And when the whole land is encompassed with evil, which it's going to be and it is, only those who believe in Jesus only those that are covered with blood, Jesus' blood, only those who live in the faith shall be saved. Even though Noah or Daniel or Job, even though those men live amongst you and they are pillars of the faith in the Old Testament, even though I won't spare not a one of the rest of you, they'll be saved because of their faith in me. And that's how it's going to be. When Jesus comes back, and he will, I don't care what philosophy says. I don't care what anything says. He said he's coming back. Amen. In the air, in the clouds. Amen. And we're going to be taken up. Amen. Paul said, comfort yourself with this thought. The people that sleep in the Lord, their bodies will rise up first. Amen. And then we're going to be gathered together with them in the clouds. Forever to be with Jesus. Amen. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. Amen. Man. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs>